I'm, as many of you know, and in some ways it's, it's, it's preposterous that I should go on this round table, uh, I'm not a realist. Um, why I find realism so interesting is because I think it's posing the right questions, but I don't think it is, and I think everyone's said this so well, I don't need to go into it. I, I think it's classical realism that is posing the right questions. Um, and I think that that's perhaps where one should begin, is what are the questions that have been posed by classical realism and by the way in which we're re-rehearsing it. And I think we're doing it in very different ways. Some like Nike are doing it very, very, in a very targeted manner. Others are doing it in a more relaxed manner and sometimes not as acutely, I'm sure. But it seems to me that this needs to be question driven. Um, I'm not sure whether there's consensus about whether the, there are, we do have the right questions. But I want firstly to say several things. So first, my first point is to say I'm not a realist, very happy to be on this round table, but precisely I'm on this round table because I find realism very interesting because I think a certain kind of realism called classical realism is posing the right questions for us. And I think therefore it enters very well under what I do identify myself with, which is international political theory. Um, and I think we need to think about the two together more. Um, but that now said, um, and, and I will be fairly brief, um, I, I, you know, in terms of intellectual strategies, I know that once I left uh, England to go to Paris and, and, and had a certain pleasure uh, working with Jacques Derrida, um, you know, there was a strategy in the 1990s. My concern was that deconstruction wasn't doing the work that I thought it should be doing. Um, and uh, I left Britain to go to Paris to work with one or two people, uh, including Le Maître, as they like to, to say over there. Um, and I felt the following. Here was deconstruction that precisely didn't want to be a school. It wants to deconstruct schools, which all post-structuralism wishes to do, including postmodern IR theory. But I think postmodern IR theory is becoming a school. Uh, I think there are important paradoxes that we need to look at. Deconstruction became very quickly a school precisely in its way of deconstructing institutionalism. And I think that paradox became very, very tense for me when I was in Paris because everything became much more centered, much more person-oriented. Uh, very specific research agendas came out precisely because it was meant to be open. So I'm, I'm very interested in the following, and I don't necessarily all people will agree, the following paradox institutionally. If one remains open, one becomes very closed. So one's got to get the right balance between being open and having a general strategy, or maybe even a grand strategy, um, in such a way that by limiting oneself, one is actually able to remain open so that unlike other schools, yeah, particularly in IR, one doesn't simply become, self, uh, become repetition. And that is what's got obviously going on in American mainstream political science and IR. So this notion of openness, I think actually very quickly, and I think postmodernism for me shows it, I think some of you here would disagree with me, um, being open as such is not actually openness. Uh, and I think therefore one's got to get the balance between organizing, centering, and at the same time leaving things alone very carefully out. I would suggest, but I don't necessarily think that this would be you know, uh, welcomed here. I actually think that um, maybe launching some kind of journal would be very interesting. Um, as a centering, that would allow for openness. Uh, I, uh, I actually believe very strongly that one has to create a certain amount of unity in order for diversity to be possible in the first place. Mm. Um, and that is where I'm not a postmodern as a political strategy. Um, and I don't think postmodernism is political. And precisely because classical realism is interested, as some of you have argued so well in the last couple of days, and you write so well about it, it is interested about, about the political, about political autonomy, yeah? about the specificity of the political. I think, therefore, it is incumbent upon us all, if we come in, if we answer Sean's question, to think how we are going to be political about the very question he's posing. It's not simply, in other words, it's not simply an institutional question. It's a question that redounds to the very thing that we're interested in. Um, those are really the two things I wanted to say. Um, I think, uh, for myself, um, 
when I say that there are very specific questions, I think that the things that have come out for me in the last few days, they're constantly working around the question of uh, constraints, around the question of limits, around the question of prudence, around the question of ethics and politics. Um, uh, there was another one, yeah, um, however one wants to think it, uh, the question of the Enlightenment and its legacies for us, as Nick talked about so well earlier today. Um, I would want to bring to that a question that I put to um, uh, Mike earlier, um, which is, um, I do believe very strongly that classical realism can offer political vision. I, I thought that paper was, was superb on that. Um, and I do think we need to think about that seriously. I think if indeed, as Sean put it, and some of you put it very well, if one of the questions is crisis, I do think political vision is needed. I very much accept Nick saying we've got to be very careful. The question of limits is very important. Uh, intellectual hubris is the worst thing. And that's one of the great lessons of political realism that I've learned in the last few, few years very strongly, having gone through a, an intellectual strategy um, around deconstruction, but also politically in France. Um, uh, with regard to the Socialist Party. Uh, I hear, therefore, Nick's points very, very carefully. But I do think we need to provide some political vision at this moment. And I do think we need to be responsible as far as possible in a very complicated world, especially in a world where the Northwest is in relative decline. Um, but there are, you know, that will take a very long time. Um, I do think we have public responsibilities. And I think we should, uh, in our engagements with classical realisms, and all that means to all of us, we should engage in something like uh, public intellectuality, you know, public intellectuals, public responsibility, um, so that it's not just simply an academic uh, discipline and discourse that we are concerned with. Because for me, uh, classical realism and its roots, yeah, critical theory, yeah, Morgenthau, the others, uh, and again, a lot of you have been saying it, yeah? uh, it's about the responsibility of the intellectual, and we've lost that uh, in the last few years. So one of the things I dislike so much about uh, post-structuralism, having been a post-structuralist, is that it wanted to bury the intellectual in some ways, uh, though, of course, resurrected intellectuals for very specific people like Derrida, Levinas, Foucault, which, of course, have become great names. Now, these paradoxes we need to get very clearly involved in and work out what it means to be a public intellectual today. I think classical realism offers enormous resources. So I will leave it there. I thank you all very much indeed. It's been a real pleasure the last two days. And again, Sean, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the workshop. Thank you for your presence. I learned a lot. I hope you found something to that two days of intense discussion. Uh, <coughs> The, uh, when Shaw was talking about we being a school, I was kind of not a school, not a school, but uh, at least the word school was being used. So I was kind of horrified and yeah, shocked in a way because that's the last thing I would like to. Yeah, the question to, is what, to what we have instead of kind school. Of yeah. What we have instead of a school is so I would embrace very much very many uh, arguments of, of Richard. What we have instead of a school is the kind of openness, what he says, which is the unity as well. Now, the point I want to make very briefly is where I see this unity could exist. Uh, and uh, I want to go some levels, if you like, down and talk about a classroom experience. We talked about it on, on Tuesday, which irritates me again and again. And here I think there is some kind of, of uh, intellectual work to do. Um, in still making distinctions clear. So what the classroom was what irritates me is that you work for 12 weeks or even longer with students uh, on post undergrad, both undergrad and postgraduate level, and uh, you read early stuff of Morgenstern and critical theory here and there, and then after 12 weeks or 13 weeks you read the papers, the dissertation papers. And then what you find is a recapitulation of Wikipedia knowledge, is a re uh, repetition of textbook knowledge, where Monsal was a predecessor of Walt, and uh, the realism, neorealism unity, and we have a tradition of realist political thought, which goes from Thucydides, finally perfected by, by Walt, who mentioned it today, the realist tradition. How far does it exist? So this kind of irritates me in a way that you think, why the hell did I work with you? What did I, what, what was my reading list? What was on to reading? So what knowledge do you recapitulate to me now? We 
which you would read from Wikipedia or from Stanford Encyclopedia of Social Sciences or Philosophy, which is a fantastic source, open internet source, but has an awful article on, 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 on reality. Uh, it's just awful. I was writing to the editor, so that just can't. And that, come on, go away. What are you talking about? So what I kind of think here in terms of addressing the unity openness question is to <coughs> create some kind of distinction uh, against or some kind of argument, which there's still some work to do. I think there's much more interesting stuff to do, like uh, capitalizing on those questions which we can learn from Monza or from classical realism, uh, to be inspired by a more Thalian kind of analysis of line of public sphere and all kind of questions, peace, order, morality, ethics, whatever we like, take those questions seriously. But on the agenda, I would think from this experience, needs to be still some kind of awareness work, if you like, namely to say here, we have a very unfortunate coincidence of two terms, but we put neorealism in double inverted commas, namely the neo as well as the realism. There's nothing which is neo, and there's nothing coming in relation to realism. That is the way I see it. So we have clear distinctions on ontological, epistemological, and methodological levels. Uh, and uh, to make this kind of clear that we talk about something very different when we talk about classical realism. We have nothing, there may be nice chaps, but nothing in common in terms of scholarship. Or at least if there's something in common, it needs some meticulous work to sort it out, what exactly it is and where the differences are. Uh, so that may be some point to think about for some kind of strategy, some kind of further openness, yes, but some kind of identification may be necessary, uh, if it's not to be a school, but some kind of movement, mm. if you like, right? Uh, I would like to embrace very much what Richard just said, uh, against any kind of school thinking, any kind of closure. Uh, it's a horrifying idea for me to be labeled. Yes, exactly. Uh, How do you avoid I'm, I'm not a realist at all. I, was, I don't know where I'm coming from intellectually, and I don't want to be labeled by someone else. Mm -hmm. This openness for myself, and I think that's a feeling we all share in, in a way. But at least to make clear, we are talking about something else than neo realism, and we don't want to be confused, don't want to be inflated, and don't want to be mixed up. So I leave it here. And, uh, is, is again, any, I enjoyed the discussions very much. I learned a lot. Thank you very much. I hope it, it continues somewhere, someday. Thank you. Is he a realist in this room? It's, it's a bit like yeah, the, the scene in Monty Python's Life of Brian. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you're all in the middle. You're all in the middle. Why what? <laughs> what do the realists ever do for us? <laughs> 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 Would the real realists stand up? <laughs> but no, it's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, it, I, I, I was. Um, I did um, sort of notice the contrast that you know because we all wear different hats. We all go to we have different sort of sections that we're involved in. We're, uh, and you know, one of mine is, is gender and I are. When I, I hang out with my, with, with my feminist IR friends, we all say we're feminists. I'm quite proud of the fact. When I hang out with my IPE friends, we all spend our time pinning labels on each other. But when I come here, everyone sort of avoids, no, no, please, no, no label on me. Um, anyway, um, uh, I, have a, I, have, I have five, five points that I sort of took. Um, I sort of wrote this up as, as we were going through the... Uh, the round table. Uh, one is really one of sort of definition. Uh, about three of them about classical realism, uh, and the and on one is is answering Sean's question, and then I sort of end on a, on a question. So I'll just go through them very quickly. The first one was was one that was troubling me going into the panel at Visa, and I did I, I did reveal this to Sean uh, 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 going up to the well. We always we'll talk about good of ethics. Um, now I know I don't know what ethics is, but I don't know what the is. I, I did when I was a first year. I could tell you, I could define it. It was a textbook. Uh, but it was from a textbook, exactly. We should burn all textbooks. Um, but uh, uh, but it's, it's more than just that. There's, a, there's another problem, it's, 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 it's the moving goalposts. It's like, it's, it reminds me of the, uh, of the REF. Uh, the goalposts keep changing on realism. Uh, 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 what happened, happened to the English school? It used to be realist, it broke away. Uh, and we've got you know, sort of a secessionist movement going on. It used to be including it, no longer are. And then people who have discovered as realists, mm -hmm. so we bring in Kant all of a sudden. Uh, 
So, you know, the, the shifting goalposts here and what realism is, I mean, realism can be a very problematic category. Now, that isn't necessarily a problem because, uh, you know, you can have fun with the category that's, uh, that, that, that floats around, but still, you know, it's an issue. But, you know, looking at uh, classical realism, and again, this is something in terms of, uh, of what we were doing in, uh, what we were discussing in the, in the round table, is um, who gets studied and why? Um, I, there was a lot of exclusions here. Now, I know that people in this room have written on, uh, on, on other, other realists, uh, but, you know, there were, there were missing realists here. There was no Schumann, there was no Schwarzenberg, there was no Keith. Okay, well, they, sh they showed up every now and again uh, as bit part actors. Um, um, you know, maybe they exclude themselves. And also, do we acquiesce to the siphoning off of the English school? Do we now not talk about Martin Weiss because the English school talks about Martin Weiss? Um, do, do we ac acquiesce to that? Uh, do we set ourselves up as an American school? We are no longer realists, but like the English school, we're the American school. <laughs> we look at, uh, um, I don't know. Um, and also, I mean, I suppose the question of, of, of uh, a category of classical realism, do we underplay the links uh, as many of many of you explored, and, uh, uh, and I've done in my own work from the opposite direction, the the, the important the fundamental links that classical realists have with uh, with those uh, we consider non-realists. So we could think of Pollyanna, of Mitrani, uh, of Deutsch, of Littmann, of Dewey, blah 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 blah. Okay. And uh, can we think of realists as self-contained group in that sense? Do we have to do we have to look at? And again, this sort of um, destabilizes uh, the concept of classical realism. Uh, my third point was. You know, again, what was coming through here, there was a lot of the crisis of the, um, them dealing with the crisis of, uh, of the modern, modern society, uh, crisis of industrial society, uh, the role of morality in, 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 in a world where, uh, um, where God seemed distant or, or, or gone completely. But in some respects, there's an elephant in the room here when we're looking at uh, uh, classical realism. And, and, and that this is part of the problem as well, a bit like Richard. I mean, I signed up really as a vulgar degree in, you know, uh, and I'm finding myself, as I get older, getting more and more materialist. Um, uh, perhaps returning to my roots, I don't know. Uh, but um, you know, the, the big thing we've been missing here is industrial society, particularly since it's industrial society, uh, particularly the development of fossil fuel dependent societies because it's coal and it's oil. Uh, it kind of gives birth, in some respects, to what we know of as, as uh, a specific study of international relations. Uh, people who are dedicated to studying international relations. Because it becomes a, becomes a problem then, because of imperialism, because of the need for raw materials, blah, 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 various, various issues, uh, the, op the opening up of the non-Western world. Um, and uh, it seems as though, in some respects, that we're talking around this when we talk about the, the, the crisis of modern society. Um, and uh, the fourth point uh, is there are silences here as well that I noticed. Maybe it's because of the other hats I wear. Um, you know, I wonder. Um, this is, of course, uh, uh, we have John Robson here, deeply Eurocentric. Uh, it's all about Westerners, particularly English speakers or, or Germans who've learnt English, uh, speaking to English speakers. Uh, and, and gender. Uh, gender's not here either. Um, um, and the fifth point, this is the one that Sean actually wants, because that's why I talk about strategy, <laughs> is uh, I agree. I mean, that's the same reaction to schools as well. Uh, and I was wondering how we deal with this, because yes, we don't want to go off and do some kind of amorphous GA, uh, where we kind of sort of uh, uh, try and wait for structure to emerge uh, uh, out of the ether. Uh, and I wonder if, um, again, maybe this being presumptuous of me, but um, maybe um, a kind of return to the sort of uh, philosophy of, of science is not a bad idea. idea. Now maybe this is a bit of self-promotion in the sense that, that Duncan Bell and myself have both read and tried to sell Peter Gallison with absolutely no success whatsoever for international relations. Uh, but the idea that Peter Gallison has in terms of, of, of how science is structured, not structured around ideas, not structured around uh, um, uh, necessarily about, around a specific intellectual project, but structured around, in a sort of an anthropological sense, structured around language, structured about, around venue. Uh, and language, of course, is, crucially is a pigeon language. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a simplified language because we are coming from so many different Places, uh, um, uh, so that we have a uh, we have a venue where where we sit and we come together. We don't agree, but where we come together and we exchange ideas and, uh, and insights from from. Uh, and this, of course, is uh, based very much on his studies of um, of, uh, of of physics. Finally, I suppose I'll just end on a on, on a question um, because classical realism has been used a lot here. And I don't know. I, I do mean this as a question. I, I have no ulterior motive here, but, but I wonder does the 
be a plus. Is it necessary to have the capacity of battery in order to study the people who work for the project? Um, is it doing damage to the study room by, by even having this term? I don't know. Uh, but, um, but anyway. Very good. Michael. Last question, yes, you have to have the category. The category is a bus. Without the bus, you can't get anywhere. Um, but the bus has many seats on it, I think. But let me let me divide it into three, but I hope I didn't talk for all. I divide it into three categories. Um, the video thing allowed me to do this without insulting you. You can listen without them seeing that you're actually writing. Um, classical realism as an, as an intellectual project, I want to talk about as an academic project and as a political project. These three things are related, but not identical. Um, first thing, classical realism is an intellectual project. First thing to recognize, I think, is A, not to beat oneself up. The vibrance around this is remarkable, right? I'm gonna date myself here, but when I look back, at, Christ, I'm getting older, but, you know, when, you, when I look back 20 years ago, nobody would have talked about this stuff, right? Nobody. It was dead in the water, deader than dead. If you came out of crypt theory, classical realism was everything that you wanted to avoid and bury, right? First you buried it, then you moved on to the neos and da 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 The success, the migrants around this is remarkable, right? I mean, I'm sure if Sean had had the funding that we could have three times as many people in this room dead easily and still be excluding a ton of people. So I think one has to be very, very, very positive um, one has to be very positive about the diversity and the issues that it deals with. Negatively, one has to, I think, from here, or maybe I have heard Richard uh, Roshi had left, it would be interesting to know. I think one does have to try to avoid some of the tendencies. I'm going to play off certain schools that I've been kind of involved with in these two decades that I've been doing this for already. Um, I think we have to avoid some of the lessons that you can learn out of postmodern I. Um, a tendency to become too focused on very, very small issues, particular figures, particular themes, it becomes extraordinarily internal, um, or particular logics become dominant. You know, one can understand this is the tension between school and movement or whatever it is, but I think there are lessons to be drawn from what I would call the failure of postmodern IR. When I look back 20 years ago, if you had said classical realism and Postmodern international relations are two contending positions in IR, which is going to win? There would be no contest, right? Their whole piece work would be miles ahead. I don't think that is the case anymore. And I think there are real lessons that we can learn from that, and we should. Um, where I think something might be really interesting here, it'd be really interesting to hear both Bill's perspective on this and other people. I do think there's a lot of potential in the engagement with if we take if we take Nick Dio's argument seriously, right, that, that I R emerged, and I hope there are people who have problems with this here, that I R emerged as a particular political philosophy, a particular vision of the world, the world what he calls the realist gambit, right, and that gambit basically failed, right. One of the reasons that I think it failed, and there are many reasons, but one of the reasons I think it failed is partly because political theory became increasingly formalist, and one of its main But on the other hand, political theory, you know, John Gennell's wonderful line, the descent of political theory, also cut out from underneath. We may be looking at a moment here now where you can begin to look at a proper re-engagement between international political theory and political theory. It may be, as Bill says, that there are very, very limited possibilities for engagement from that. But I think it'd be really, really interesting to explore what they are. That potentially really has to have some legs, uh, one way or another. Um, as, from, as an academic project, let me just draw out three quick points here. The first, the, the other part of my life is security studies, and I think, you know, there are really interesting lessons to be learned here as an academic project. I was for a long time involved in, in I still am involved in critical security studies. And critical security studies is now conceived of as having three genres, right? Even if those genres are going to be kind of geographical, they're not everything about all over the place, but there was a kind of, you know, Ola Weber's lovely phrase was avarice with Copenhagen and Paris, right? Avarice with was the kind of like the vanguard, it did emancipation. Copenhagen did 
securitization or waiver and da 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 Paris, the Zan. Paris, the year you go, is kind of like would you think French things, right? <laughs> um, if we look at these two things, sociology, if we put it that way, right? The year you go, the proper, proper inventors were the sociologists. Organization of French things, or sociology. <laughs> that's, that's it. It's this typical, typical anglicization of the French everything. That's why they hate us. Um, and with whole and proper. So um, if we look at these, interestingly, I think the least successful in some ways has been the other aspect of it. Right? It made all the right, but emancipation has not had an agenda. The most successful has probably been the public. And one of the reasons for that is Copenhagen has an empirical practical research agenda. You can study securitization. It is a method. And it is a method with a political quotient attached to it. Maybe multiple political quotients, but it's there. Paris, I think, the same thing. So there is a real question here. How far can one move as theoretical reflection that does not lead to practical reflection? I'm going to come back in a minute, but I think there are really important lessons to be learned there. This connects into the question of how a classical realist, a renewed classical realist, could engage, and I'm going to come back to that, that was a really interesting presentation yesterday, could engage in contemporary analysis of real political issues without falling what I think you quite accurately characterize as Goyce's tendency towards political punditry. Do you end up effectively writing intelligent authors for the left team? Right? Is that all it is? If so, I think there are real challenges there. Um, and this is a real challenge as an academic project. If one is thinking about moving this thing out of its geographical location, right now it's UK slash certain parts of continental Europe, into the United States, because those last two things are absolutely crucial. Do you have an empirical research agenda, and do you have an empirical research agenda that can speak to the world in something at the very least as elevated punditry, but more than that. I think that's absolutely crucial. So, final thing. I think these things are going to come to a head soon. Uh, the academic project can continue to go on within its own confines. But as a political project, classical, the revival of classical realism has been historically lucky. Right? It's been historically lucky because we had things like the Iraq War, right? the War on Terror, which mapped on really, really nicely, which made a classical realism look remarkably relevant again, because it seemed to counsel against all the stuff that people were doing. And it allowed us to make common cause with people who we don't really have a lot in common with intellectually, but who we actually have a lot in common with politically. John Hirschheimer, Steve Walt, right? What unifies us and those two guys? Physician Pura. Skepticism about the war on terror. If that world is beginning to fade, the harder edge of classical realism reemerges. And we should never forget, we do, we do the philosophy of classical realism. In political punditry and in political representation, this stuff, both historically and contemporarily, has some pretty damn hard edges. Right? And when we start to talk about Sean, when we start to talk about Seamus, we start to talk The comfy accommodation between philosophical classical realism and that part of the legacy begins potentially to come apart. And I think that's a really, really important issue. Um, and John P. Kirshner, for example, uh, had a really nice article in the GAR last year attacking Hirschheimer's analysis of China. There are really big issues there that I think we need to confront. You know, Hirschheimer's making a lot of running mistakes out of his analysis of China. He claims that pretty radical analysis of China. Um, and I think we need to, to go with that. Finally, I want to the most speculative thing I have to say. No, sorry, my last, my last line on this. Um, when Vivek and I first presented this paper and we presented it today, we presented it at an ISA workshop and we discussed it with John Hirsch. Uh, we had a beer afterwards and it was a very pleasant occasion, et cetera, et cetera. And he said to me at one point, he said to me, you know, he said, Michael, he said, the problem with your realism is it doesn't have enough Right? It's a typical
couple of years trying to formulate. Thank you, Bob. Okay. Um, what he meant, uh, he didn't say what he meant, but I think it was clear. Um, finally, and this is my most speculative one, but people are much more, much better at this than I am. My, my argument increasingly is that one must understand the classical realism of the late 1940s, early mid 1940s, through the 1950s, as an attempt to save the Classical realism in liberalism. You cannot understand it any other way, certainly in the American context. It attempted to evoke a certain form of American liberalism. At that political period, that was a viable political project. It worked, or at least it, it, it had a place in political contestation. I am not so sure that that kind of political liberalism any longer really in contemporary real political discourse. Why that is the case, I find incredibly puzzling, and I do not know, and this is what the 1984 assignments in order to find out why. But if that suspicion is true, if realism was really an attempt to save a non-rationalist liberalism, and that form of liberalism is increasingly unviable then one's a sneaking suspicion that classical realism may be in fact unrealistic. That is, the social conditions of its production no longer match the historical condition of our times. Maybe not tragic, but certainly paradoxical, and I think something really worth thinking about, but not something that I have, have any proper idea. But that is something I'd like to And thanks for a terrific conversation over the last couple of years. So I think the first thing is more on that, definitely. Um, and, and what I would say is to situate that generation of realists in the wider penumbra of the, the crises they perceive themselves as responding to, uh, as a number of the papers in this book, John Duff, um, who, and also not, not to be too worried about, at this level at least, about the discipline question. In other words, it really doesn't matter if somebody is now like Affleck or my art or Bloom and Theory or history uh, or even philosophy or, or law or sociology. It, it, what matters is the interesting ideas and the context of their generation. And that kind of stuff needs to be done. It is being done, done very well, but we need a lot more of it. And, and there are figures, you know, you look mentioned the, the issue about you know, who gets studied and why and why and all that. And for very obvious reasons. But there are very, very interesting figures, not merely the English school, even though you absolutely, Martin White is a very interesting figure and a very, very tricky figure, Butterfield too. Uh, there's a wonderful biography just come out by a colleague of mine, Sam Andrews, of Butterfield, which has a super chapter on his work on international relations. But there's people who have not yet had that kind of treatment. Uh, Arnold Walkers, who I think is one of the most interesting, significant first generation realists, who has He's not vanished because he's cited and he's referred to, but he's never had the kind of sustained theoretical attention that Morgan Price had, Nichols had, and I think that's a huge gap. And you know, I occasionally mention the potential PhD students. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> oh no, I want to write about critical security stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there are figures like this who 
who are enormously influential, much more influential than we realize sometimes, whose, whose terms have come into the parlance of people sometimes today. The pole of power and the pole of influence. National security is our big risk. And these are really powerful essays. And somebody like Wolfers needs a lot more work. Uh, purely, as it were, as a, an act of intellectual recovery and to what they might offer to the way in which we think about pressing problems of international relations. So the first thing I would say, I guess, is there's a huge agenda out there, intellectually, academically, recovering a lot of this work that has been allowed to go into neglect for all kinds of reasons that we talked about in the papers over the last day or two, and we all know very well. So that's the first point. Second point, um, and it's been touched on by a couple of people on the round table already, but I just wanted to sort of push it, because I think it's really quite important. Luke mentioned the fact that, you know, with, with John Hobson in the 18th century, it's a totally real central conversation, and I mean, it needs it. <laughs> but the conversation about realism is not. Mm. Uh, I did, of course, this semester, or last semester, uh, at St Andrews, which invited students to read a number of different realists, inverted commas, from different cultural traditions and across different time periods. Uh, and so we had, uh, we looked at Ibn Khaldun. I've heard of Ibn Khaldun. And we looked at a modern, we looked at a modern Chinese thinker, Yan Tzu Tong. Yan Tzu Tong was trained in Berkeley in the 1970s and 80s. He wasn't supervised by Ken Waltz because he was an Africanist in those days. Um, but he nonetheless knew Waltz and becomes essentially a neo-realist, but a neo-realist with a, an interestingly Chinese twist. And he's, the, the book that I set the students to read was a collection of his essays gathered together by Daniel Bell uh, for ancient Chinese thought, modern Chinese power, in which Yang Tong uses a Kuikin book to inform a realist understanding, a neo-realist understanding of Chinese problems. Now, in other words, what I'm suggesting here is there's a lot of stuff out there that bears on realism in general that doesn't get much airtime in, in Anglophone or not, and that that's a mistake. It's not, not a, I, I don't think it's wholly an accident that Daniel Bell, who, who was the editor of the Princeton series in which this book comes out, is still in Um And so I would, I would urge IR people to use that kind of perspective, to engage Indian thought, of which there is a substantial amount, Ian Hall, um, who was here, I believe, yesterday, has done, is doing really interesting work on Indian conceptions of foreign policy, Chinese thought. In other words, realism is not a Western phenomenon. Classical realism is a Western phenomenon of a certain kind. And I'd just like to, and for all of the good reasons that we've discussed, and we need to understand those reasons, but, but it has resonances, family resemblances, as Luke and Stan might have said elsewhere. And we should explore those relations. That's, that's a conversation to be had with scholars from other societies, scholars from other countries, as well as amongst ourselves. And I'd just like to add one thing, which um, maybe to some extent is different from, from, from two other people who've said it on the round table. I mean, I think it's perfectly true, as I was making earlier, that you know, obviously the case that someone like Woods or Mishan or whatever have methodological and philosophical differences to someone like Milton Carl or Niebuhr or Wolfers. That is to say, many contemporary Um, and most of the leading contemporary realists of whatever strike. You know. But one exception, of course, is Woods, who does. But he does a different kind. I mean, he, he became obsessed with the philosophy of science, didn't publish anything for years, because he was immersing himself in the debates between Popper and Macintosh and Bayard and blah, blah, blah. And, he, and theory of international politics, on one level, comes out of that engagement. But it's also worth emphasizing, um, I think, that Waltz certainly sees himself as part of his family, even if And he, at this conference in Abbott, uh, he said, if he's ever asked the essence of realism, he gives the last sentence of Reinhold Niebuhr's Children of Light and the Children of Darkness. That the essence of realism is that the children of light should possess the wisdom of the children of darkness without being corrupted by their malice. And if that is what Waltz in his mid-80s thinks about his own general orientation, it seems to me there's more of a link with the general project that perhaps the methodology suggests. Finally, and this is very, very instrumental in our aspect. It's just before the students are going to bring the students and the students in my workshop. I feel I can afford to be instrumental um, because maybe people know I don't really mean it. But nonetheless, <laughs> um, 
If one is going to be instrumental about the project of reorienting the audience, one has to ask the audience question. Who are you reorienting for? And who is to say, it is true that realism, even in the US, is under siege. If you look at the trip survey that came out recently, the most recent one, um, the number of people who identify with any of the traditional paradigms in, U in US especially is now under 50%. And if you look at the people between sort of graduate student and junior faculty, say 23, 35, 36, it's about 30%. Of those that do identify, only about 10% identify as realists. So, in other words, there is a certain sense in which, and Steve Wolf and Mearsheim, Mearsheim in a sense, I think, I'm not saying he doesn't care, but, but I think he's sufficiently insulated that he doesn't bother him too much. But something like Steve Wolf, I think, does care. And I think he is worried by it. By, by virtue of the fact that people are saying, well, we're just scientists. We don't have any apparent uh, alliance. We don't, we're not liberals, we're not Marxists, we're not realists, we're nothing. We're just staring at the facts. You know, just the facts, man. It's the drag approach to political science. Um, well, that has two possibilities in terms of our project. We can form alliances with people who want realism to be taken seriously. Uh, and Steve Walt and Mirshama and others, Bill Walthorpe, Ned Lebeau, these are not people without influence in the citadels of American political science. I am not too worried by and large about the citadels of American political science. Nonetheless, if one wants to reach an audience, if one wants to have an impact, if one wants to reorient, that's another avenue to follow, to say, well, you know, there's something going on here within classical realism, echoed however partially or in however attenuated a way by later realists, but is important. It's important for the American polity, it's important for American foreign policy. You could get, I think, some of the people who are involved in the national interest, who are involved in that, obviously, in Mishan, at least. So the third point I would make is there is a kind of audience question. And of course, the audience is going to be multiple. It's not just one. As the project continues, and it doesn't, it doesn't really matter whether we all agree or disagree. It's, we, we all agree about the importance of realism, classical realism in particular, otherwise we wouldn't be here. So in terms of getting that message across, it seems to me that there's both a huge intellectual and academic research agenda ahead of us, fantastic, wonderful, lots to do, um, and an enormous set of opportunities if we choose to press the right buttons succeed, we might succeed sometimes. So it seems to me that we actually should be, rather in an unrealistic way, ambitious. We should set out to remind people in IR and elsewhere of the significance of this material. That doesn't mean we always agree with it, because of course we don't. Um, but also of its applicability to the concerns that face us now. And in a sense, responding to Mike, I guess, even if the answer is that classical realism doesn't, That fact itself ought to be really interesting for us and ought to create opportunities of, of alliances, some of which have already begun to be drawn by, between democratic theorists and cosmopolitan theorists and, and realists. So that there's a lot there. And strategically, instrumentally, within the field system, whatever you want to call it, I think there's an awful lot that can be done that has 